I'm going to call uh, uh, the meeting to open uh, to order. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order. And uh, I'm going to ask Ron Day, if he will, to lead us in prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day that you've sent our way. And Father, we, may we not take it for granted. May we just take it as a blessing that you've smiled upon us this very day. As Lord, as we go <clears throat> about the business of the college this evening, that Father, that we would continue to look what is in the best interest of the college for those who we represent. We thank you for the staff. We thank you for the leaders of this of this uh, community college. Would you continue to bless it to all of those areas that it serves? We ask, Father, that you would be with our nation and that we would, in essence, come together, that we would look to you for your leadership and for your guidance. We ask for forgiveness of our sins. For it's in your son's name we would ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Dr. Terry, do you want to call the roll? I will. Uh, I'll start with you, Ray. Uh, here. Okay. Jerry Stone? Here. Mike Hembry? I am here. Ron Day? Here. Steve Grant? Here. David Monk? Here. Dr. Reisinger? Here. And Paula Kimball? Here. Everybody's uh, here and present. All right, we'll move into the first item of the business for tonight, the president's report. Okay, I'm going to start off the president's report tonight by letting Dr. Um, Parnell, Dr. Philip Parnell, give us an update on, on what his plans are for uh, the near future and for next school year regarding the, a strategic enrollment management plan. Dr. Parnell? Thank you, Dr. King. Um, Norma, uh, can you put that presentation up so everybody can see it? I'm getting there. Hold on. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> In the meantime, um, have any, has anybody on, on the call here heard of strategic enrollment management before? Other than the three or four people that I see who saw it earlier today in another presentation? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. It, it, and I, I, I give you a, just a bit of a Oh, here we go. Looks like we're going to start real quick here. Okay, uh, do you want to hit the slideshow and say from beginning? What? On the top, on the top of here in the in the menu where it says slideshow. I'm pointing to it, but you can't see what I'm pointing to, can you? <laughs> it's hard not to not to point. There we go. That's it. Um, well, as Dr. King says, this is something that we're going to be starting on campus here very, very shortly. Matter of fact, we had our first meeting um, about this today with a number of people, and you'll see how those people were uh, in just a few minutes. But this is called strategic enrollment management. And Norma, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, it's been it's been around off and on for a long time. It's never, it hasn't been called the same thing, but if we, if, if we go back to after World War II, when we had all of the GIs coming back from overseas um, and the GI Bill came into play, you can imagine how much change that brought into the community, well, into the colleges and universities out there, because there were millions of ex-GIs, people that were out of the army now that were coming back, and they had to hire people, they had to, they had to go out and, and find ways to do financial aid, which was something they had never had to do before. And that was really one of the first major times we had to do, go out and actively control or manage enrollment. And so we go forward a little bit more. If, if some of you who were involved with education back in the late 70s, early 80s, you know that we had a, a very extreme um, problem with um, enrollment during that time. That enrollment, basically the, the bottom dropped out of enrollment and schools were going broke all over the country. And so we had to put something in place. And at that point, really what we were doing was we were using marketing and we were using recruiting in ways we had never done before. Um, the budget crisis, if, if, if some of you can remember when we had state supported schools um, and then we had state sponsored schools and now we just have state related schools because of the funding. Um, there's just not as much state funding as there was that really started growing in the 90s and enrollment management grew a little bit more because we had to try to find ways to level out all of our fiscal um, fiscal responsibilities. 
So not only were we looking at leveling out the bumps and the, the hills and the valleys in our enrollment, but we were also looking at finding ways to level out those hills and valleys for our, for our, for our dollars as well. And then in the late 90s, um, we really started bringing this whole concept together into a function that was really campus-wide. So right now at TVCC, we've got a lot of different issues that are that, not issues. We've got a lot of different projects that are going on to impact our enrollment in a positive way. So we've got some things going on in the advising office. We've got some things going on in Kelly Townsend's area. We've got some things going on in other parts of the academic uh, area on campus. Well, and we, of course, we've got recruiting going on, but those things are all sort of standalone. They, they, they're out doing what they do in that office, and they're not really working together as a cohesive team. So Norma, go to the next slide, if you would, please. What strategic enrollment management does, what, what stem to, and, and by the way, there are very few colleges that are not doing what we, this STEM project, this STEM program today. Uh, and you can see what I've underlined here. These are three different definitions, but they all kind of say the same thing. Um, and what's important about strategic enrollment management, as I said before, it's, it's no longer those individual projects by individual offices. What we're doing is we're providing a framework for all those offices to come together and work toward one common goal. So it, it synergizes the effort to, to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to help students and improve the uh, institutional outcomes. And we do that by, use, by, by making sure we're using what we consider best practices in the field. We're using data um, and, and data is probably one of the biggest things we do with this because we're looking for a return on investment. If we're going to invest something, uh, invest our time and our energy and our resources in a project to help our enrollment, we wanna make sure we're getting a good return on that. Um, and I'll go down to this, to the, uh, to the, where is it? It's the bottom one. It's a comprehensive process and it's designed to help higher ed institutions achieve and maintain optimum student recruitment, retention, and graduation. And really, it follows the student all the way from when that student is a suspect. Maybe, maybe they're just on our website. Maybe they're just looking around on our website. We can now follow that student from there all the way through when they file an application. When they take that application and they register for classes, they come in the fall, they come back in the spring, they come back the next fall, we can follow them through all of these processes, all of these time frames, into the fact, into the point where they're getting a job in their field, and later on when they're sending their kids here, and then later on still when they're making donations to the campus. And that's all involved with this with this SEM or strategic enrollment management process. And, and by the way, we'll, we'll make sure each of you gets a copy of this presentation so that we so that you can look at it at your leisure. Next slide, please, Norma. Okay, so why do we need SIM? Well, uh, COVID, while it looks like we're going to be sort of um, in the clear financially because of the COVID and the CARES Act and all the funding that we may be getting from the federal government, there's a lot of questions about whether students are going to come back or not. Um, I mean, I, I said to someone today, you know, there's a lot of students out there that, that realized during this COVID outbreak that they can they can be in their bed in their underwear and they can be going to class and they don't have to get up. They don't have to do much of anything uh, except turn on their computer. And there's a lot of parents out there from what I'm reading that they're saying, well, why do we need to spend money for you to live in the dorm? Why do we need to spend money for you to eat on campus when you can just do that here? And I know that my I and I know a number, probably all of you on, on this call, feel like there's something special about that, that college experience. You know, I, I told someone earlier today, my daughter is uh, rooming in her college with uh, a, a young lady from Argentina and she is pulling her hair out, but she's never had a roommate before. Um, she literally called me the other day and said, if I murder my roommate, will you bail me out of jail? Uh, so she's learning a ton about how to get along. And we need to be, we need that college environment for students to learn. And I'm really kind of afraid that, that maybe some people who need to come back and get that experience aren't going to come back. So we need, to, we need some to make sure they're doing that. We also have a, have a pretty large downturn in community college enrollment nationwide. Uh, we went from about 1.2 million in 2009 to about 870,000 in 2018. That's a huge decline. I mean, that's 
close to 400,000 student decline in those years. And that didn't even include COVID. So I think we need the SEM program for that as well. And also, I was, I was just looking at a map last night because I have nothing better to do in my spare time. And I was looking at East Texas and just seeing how many colleges there are in East Texas. And it's amazing. Just, I mean, they're everywhere. And they're four years, they're two years, they're all over the place. And what I'm hearing from students and what I'm hearing from my own staff, and I'm hearing this from the people in the community, some students are passing us by in order to get to another college. And we've got to figure out why that's the case. Um, another reason we need SEM is because of what we call predictive modeling. We can take the data that we gather on students and we can predict down the road, two years, four years, five years, six years, what our enrollment will be. And we do that very simply. We look at the current high school enrollment for the 12 grades that are out there. And we say, oh, and, and we know this right now, we know that the ninth grade year in our, in our service area, the ninth graders right now will be one of the biggest classes we have coming in. So that's, that, 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 that predictive modeling gives us a chance to forecast not only enrollment and how, how many English classes we'll need and how many math classes we'll need, but it also gives us a chance to forecast the, the funding that we'll, that we'll need as well. And the last thing that I think we probably need to do, um, I've, I've been looking at our retention rates and our graduation rates and, and, and such. And one, thing, and one thing that goes into it, one thing that concerns me is we've got a fairly low, uh, low graduation rate for, at, at the two-year point. So one, something that SIM can do for us, we can take an incoming class of students and we can look at their characteristics and compare those characteristics with successful students of our past. And we can rank those students. I mean, for just for instance, we can rank them platinum, gold, and bronze. The platinum are the students who've done everything they needed to be successful. There's nothing we could do to make them not successful. The gold, maybe they missed a few things. And the bronze, well, maybe they're the ones that are going to have the most trouble, we understand. We can start reaching out to those students before they even get here to help them be prepared for college. And that's one of the things that, that, that SIM will allow us to do. So all of those reasons, I think we probably we need something like this. We need a coordinated effort to reach out into, into our service area and look at, this to, look at our enrollment uh, affairs. Next slide, please. Um, this is what the this is what the organizational chart for our SEM program will be. Uh, as you can see, um, and I'm trying to I'm using my mouse again, and that doesn't work. But um, you can see right in the center of all this, it says the strategic enrollment management plan and goals. That's what we're going to be. That's the product we'll be putting together, and that plan will try to figure out all of the goals that we need to do with the enrollment piece in order to meet our our campus strategic plan. On either side of that, you see the two co-chairs are, are Kristen and myself. We're doing, we're doing this um, so that people understand that um, we're not silos. And so they understand that the academic uh, division and the student services division is on the same page with this. And so that's one of the, that's, I think that's very important. Um, and then you can see below all of this, you see all the, the, the pretty colored boxes. Those are individual subcommittees of this overall committee overall SIM committee, and they'll be working on specific items. Um, you can see, I'm, I'm gonna pick on Kelly because I see Kelly in the, in the picture here, but Kelly will be leading what we call a workforce um, committee, subcommittee. So she's gonna be working on how to improve our, our, our communication, how to improve our program, how to get more people into our workforce programs on campus than we've ever had before. And you can see all these other committees as well. And the, the thing about this is, this is not the sum that are the total of the committees that we'll have out there, these subcommittees. These are just examples of the ones that we'll have. Matter of fact, the first three that we're going to be working on are the blue and the salmon and the yellow, which would be the data group. We need to establish a data, sort of a data center. So we've got all of the data that we need to be able to measure our return on investment. The marketing communication group will be one of those first three, as will the recruiting group, because those are probably the most I don't, know, I don't want to call it low hanging fruit, but they can have the biggest impact on our next year's class of any of these groups. So they'll be where we start. And then of course you can see below there, we're going to have about 25 people in this, in this committee. And that is a huge committee. Um, but I think we can make it work. And, and matter of fact, um, Kelly, I'll, I'll let you say something here. Uh, we had, the, we had this first, we had the grand opening today of this with this group. 
and it seemed to go fairly well to me. Kelly, what did you think? Um, I think it went very well. Um, I, I really, um, everybody seemed very receptive. Um, there was a lot of excitement in the room um, talking about it and looking at um, all of the great things that could possibly come out of this. And I think it's going to bring all of us. Um, we're already a family. There's no doubt that we're already a family. But I think that this is going to make us a more uh, communicative family than what we may be, what we are right now. So it was a great idea. I'm very, Thank very you, excited Kelly. about this. Thank you, Kelly. Now, Kristen, I know you're on too, and you are co-chairing this. Is I don't actually I don't see you anymore. Um, is there anything you want to say, Kristen? No, I just want to reemphasize the fact that it is a cross-campus um, effort that it's not gonna be just one department. It right. is going to be all of us working together. And one of the things I think Philip will talk about possibly is the fact that we're not, uh, some of you may be looking at this for the first time within TV, the TVCC instructional or staff world. And you may be thinking, but we already have that committee or we already have that. Um, we're not going to double the work for nope. anyone. We're going to look at reutilizing the people in a different way. But I, I think that it's going to be, um, it's just going to uh, follow right up into our pathway work that we've already been doing at TVCC. And I think that it's going to be a, a great effort in the long run for our students. Thanks, Kristen. And, and I, I agree. Everywhere I've ever done this, this has worked tremendously. The first time I, I ever worked on a program like this, uh, I was at the University of North Dakota, and we implemented a program just exactly like this. And it was the highest enrollment the University of North Dakota had ever had. Um, I left five years later, six years later, and they stopped this program and they went right back to where they had been for the previous 30 years. So this program does work and it, it can make a huge difference on campus. And I just noticed, Emily, you're, you're there. Um, and there will definitely be a, a, a subcommittee for what you are going to be doing when you get to campus as well. Because again, we're looking for this, we're, we're looking at this from the suspect point where they where they just are maybe on our website or asking a question all the way through the donor stage and making sure that those efforts are completely coordinated with the entire campus so this this is this this is one of my favorite parts of my job i love i love enrollment management it, it, it's more fun than than, than that well some people might not agree with me but i think it's i think it's great fun um next slide please um it, it, basically what we're saying here, and, and this, this pertains more to the folks today in the room, but I'll, I'll share it with you guys as well. Um, the people that you saw their names, they will be basically serving continuously on this committee. But the, uh, the charge that they will have is not a huge, it's not a huge weight, it's not a huge carry. Basically we'll be meeting once to twice a month, uh, in the beginning especially, to start working on our SWOT analysis, making sure we know what goals we need to put forward, all those kind of things. Um, and after that, a lot of the work actually goes into the subcommittee. So those folks will be doing most of the work at that point. Um, Kristen and I will be making res uh, recommendations out of the, the, the processes that we're doing, as well as what we see as, as end goals. We'll be making recommendations to the president and to the pathways committee. And again, I think it was, um, maybe I don't know if it was Kristen or if it was um, uh, Kelly, but it is a very diverse group. It's 25 people, including students, that we'll add in the fall. And so um, that diversity in that group is going to help us make sure we reach out to every single part of campus. And again, the committee as a whole will be overseeing all the subcommittees. Next slide, please. The subcommittees uh, will vary through time. Um, basically, we're going to implement the, the, the subcommittees based on what our SWOT analysis says. And SWOT, if you don't know, is, is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we will begin working on that analysis. Actually, Kelly's gonna lead us in that analysis with the group when we meet next. And so we're gonna, we're gonna sort of brainstorm our ideas and see where we have strengths, where we have weaknesses, and where we need to grow. And that will determine which of those subcommittees we have in place, first, second, third, and fourth. Um, and the nice thing about it for the employees is once the work of that particular subcommittee is done, they'll go on hiatus. So that we're not gonna just meet to keep meeting like, like many committees do. Um, this one, once your job is done, you're gonna go off to the side and wait till we do our next round and you'll come back at that point. Um, and again, we could have a subcommittee from any area on campus 
that deals with students because that's our, that's our major goal. Um, and and I, I do wanna mention this, and this is kind of what Kristen just said, we're not adding committees. We may be bringing some current committees into the SIM committee world, but we're not gonna just be adding committees for the sake of adding committees. So right now there's already a retention committee that's been working for, for I don't know how long, Kristen, how long has that been working? Sorry, I couldn't get to the button. Okay. Um, we have been working on pathways for about four years now. Okay, so we're not gonna start all that work over again we're just gonna bring that retention committee into the SIM world and combine it with all the other subcommittees so that, that that work is maximized. So it's not just in a silo by itself, it's gonna be maximized by all the other work. Uh, next slide, please. And this is how we're gonna build our SIM plan and what our SIM plan will actually do. As we sit down and we say, okay, what are our weaknesses? What are our strengths? We're gonna be analyzing those outside forces that are impacting the TDC enrollment landscape, okay? Now, that could be anything. That can be lack of funding from, from the state. That could be a decline in funding from the feds. That can be, um, like I said, the ninth grade class this year in our, in our service area is the biggest one in, in recent memory. So that's gonna all have to be analyzed in there. So we're gonna know that when the ninth grade class gets to here, we're gonna need more English classes. We're gonna need more math classes. We're gonna need those things. And so we might need, you know, additional um, adjunct faculty even, and we'll be able to predict that. Um, we're also going to be able to take a look at anything we're missing in terms of demographic groups or geographic groups that we're not currently reaching out to. <coughs> Who could we partner with in this? Um, several, a couple of us just went down to Palestine to see if we can help grow the campus a little bit more. And we're gonna be holding a, um, a community event on campus this summer to try to build some interest from the Palestinian community in that campus. And so we're gonna be looking at who we can partner with. Can we get the mayor to come out? Can we get the civic leaders to come out and be part of that? So that's, we'll be looking at all those things. And we're gonna really try to prioritize, like I said earlier, those really high value ROI uh, opportunities because this, this STEM is, SIM is not hard if we work together, but it is time consuming and it does take a lot of detail. So we wanna maximize that time that we're putting in and any resources that we're putting in so that we're getting the best return on our investment that we can. And then that group will start to use that information that they've gathered and set actual goals for our enrollment. And we'll do that making sure that we're in line with the college's strategic plan and our mission and such. And then as we begin to implement those goals and we get some results from those goals, we're gonna to try to assess that ROI, assess, the, assess, assess how well we've managed to complete those goals. Um, and then after that, bottom line, it's, it's, it's like going out and making sure that we either need to keep those goals moving or we need to reset and review, making sure that we're always keeping things in, in, the, in the right place. And then we take all of that and we make those recommendations up to Pathways and up to the president, and then we implement those and we, we make sure that they work. And one thing that came out today, because, and I don't know where this comes from, but several folks in the room said, well, you know, what if we, what if we try something and it doesn't work? Well, okay, then we know one thing that doesn't work now. I mean, that's a good thing in my world. I mean, when, when we, my, my favorite word is entrepreneurial and, and basically entrepreneurial means risk taker. Now we, we take educated risk, but we have to take risk if we're trying something new because we really don't know what will work. We think we know what will work, but we're not absolutely certain. So there will be some retrenchment. There will be some starting over again, but we hope there's not too much. Um, and you can see the rest of that. And I think there's only one more slide and then I'll answer any questions that you might have. Just um, when I wrote my dissertation years ago, I spent a lot of time reading the works of a man named Jim Black, who is an internationally known um, author. He's, a, he, he's, a, he's an expert in strategic enrollment management and has been for the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years. And so my dissertation is full of quotes by Jim Black. Well, about five years ago, I was able to actually meet him and I brought him to my last campus and he's a phenomenal speaker. And so we are, we have, we've contracted with him to come in and be a guide for us as we move forward into this process. And he's actually going to be Zooming in, so he won't be in person, but he'll be Zooming in with us on Tuesday 
and you can see some of the topics that he's going to help us start to understand better. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. He's a, he is a great guy. Uh, a number of us will be uh, zooming into his conference this summer. He does an, um, an annual conference just for small colleges. I mean, there's a lot of places out there that will do enrollment for the large colleges, but we don't have the resources some of those large colleges do. And his conference is specifically for smaller colleges with uh, fewer resources, fewer personnel and such. And so he is going to be a great resource for us. Um, he's going to actually be coming in to speak to us at least four times over the next six or seven months. And that's going to be extremely helpful for us in getting a good start. Um, so that's, that's a, a quick down and dirty on what STEM is and what we'll be doing. Uh, I, I believe we'll have a, uh, a STEM plan, that, that strategic plan, in between six, six months and a year from now. And that's really going to help us moving forward. Are there, are there any questions at all that I can, can I answer? Philip, I, I have a, a two-part question. Okay. Uh, how will this, how will SIM impact our other campuses, number one? And number two, are we going to utilize the staff and faculty from these other campuses into your committees and subcommittees? What a great question. Yes. Today when we met, we had, uh, we had representatives from Terrell, from Palestine, from here, and I'm missing one. Oh, the, um, the Terrell HSC. So we had, we had representatives from all of those. And at, at some point, each one of those will be a separate subcommittee. Just like we've already started some work with Palestine, at some point, our, our work there is going to, to turn into a subcommittee for just Palestine. And what I envision is that that would be a few people from, um, from the Athens campus, but mostly it'd be made up by folks from Palestine. I mean, they've got the vested interest and they've got, you know, they're there and, and they probably have the most um, to win or lose by expanding enrollment in that area. And so, yeah, I think that they're, they're going to be wonderful. As I said before, we've, we've already met once, uh, even before we started the SEM project, just to get something going so we can get some more... Um, some more community involvement on campus. And one of the things we suggested was just to have a community day at the college, um, you know, bring out those bouncy houses, bring your kids, serve some food, um, and then see who we can get to come out and take part in that. We, we need to, uh, and I think from a marketing standpoint, we really need to almost have a grand opening again and introduce the community to that campus. Did that answer your question, Mike? Yes, sir. Okay. Other questions? Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, Dr. Parnell, David Mon, first of all, I, I like everything you've said, and there's no question that enrollment uh, is an important topic uh, here at TVCC and one that's been uh, in front of us for a while, uh, COVID aside, and certainly uh, with the uh, introduction of COVID into our communities. But having said that, like what you're saying, but you know, understand that, that any program or plan in order to, to know whether it's working or not, it has to have a mechanism to measure results. Mm -hmm. And could you just a short version touch on that and how you could help us to be uh, informed on, on some sort of uh, scheduled interval to, to know what's working, how well, uh, and what just is. Absolutely. And, and, and I'll give you the shortest answer I can, but I mentioned earlier that data is a huge piece of this. Um, there, we have some data gaps right now. And so one of the first things we'll be doing is working to fill in those data gaps. So once we get those gaps and we start into some of our goals, we'll be able to see, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. Here, here's a good example. Right now, we know how many people apply to the college. And right now we know how many people actually at some point register for courses. But what we haven't looked at is what we call a melt rate. So um, what is the number that starts? What is the number that ends? And how many didn't make it through the process? Now, at, at every point along the way, there's a melt rate. So going from I registered for classes to I actually showed up on the first day, there's a melt rate there. From first day to the end of the semester, there's a melt rate there. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be measuring those melt rates. And as we do that, and as we implement our goals, if the melt rate drops, 
then we will know for sure that what we're doing is working. So let's say we have a melt rate of 10% at each of those levels. And our goal is to drop that melt rate to 5%, which means we're going to keep 5% more of those students that we were losing before. That's an easy way to measure that. And, and, and so all of our goals have to be measurable for this to even work. And so that's one example of how we'll be measuring it. And I don't know what, what, uh, what my boss has, has in mind here, um, but what I've done at other institutions, and I'll be happy to do this whenever you want, I will be able, I will be willing to come back and talk about this whenever, because like I said, this is, this is the most exciting part of the job for me and I love doing this. Uh, and so anytime that, um, that the president and you guys want me to come back, I'll be happy to come back and give you a progress update. Did that, answer, did that answer your question, Mr. Monk, about the measurements and assessments and all that? It does, and I, I thank you for that. Obviously, you're committed to it, and 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 I think that's a that's a great thing to see. Uh, second question: Given your fairly short, you know, interval here at TVC, which I hope you're you're already uh, settling in and and feeling like part of it all, we certainly want that. Thank you. And from your extensive experience in in other uh, communities uh, and other community colleges. <clears throat> Do you see some opportunity, a lot of opportunity, unlimited opportunity? What, what's your, uh, what's your, your feel about that? Well, <clears throat> I, I do see some, I actually see a great deal. Um, before I, um, before I came down and interviewed, I did a, a pretty extensive project in using Texas Department of Education information um, about all of the high schools, oh, I'm sure you, we call them ISDs here, all the ISDs and their, their enrollment and tr tracking where those students were going upon graduation. Um, and so I've, I've, got that, I've got that data already, already done. And I think we have a, a way to grow the number of people that, we, um, that are graduating from those ISDs in two ways. About 52% of those students, if I remember right, and please don't, don't hold me to the number, I think it's 52% um, of those students actually move, go on to a college someplace. About 20% of those come here. And so we've got some room to grow, not only in, that, in, in those 52%, but you think about the other 48% that aren't doing anything right now. They're not going on to anywhere. And so they're probably, I'm, I'm not, not completely, but those are probably first generation, lower socioeconomic area. They're probably those students who we need to put more resources into in order to get them here. And so SIM will provide us a plan for not only those who are going someplace else to come here, but those who aren't going anywhere to come. And I believe you, using, our, using a combination of marketing, using a combination of that in our recruiting area, our academic area, um, looking at what programs that, that people want, um, being able to work with our community relations folks, being able to, Emily, being able to work with her area and pull all of that together. I think we have a, a, have a way of growing quite a lot. Now, some, some, some campuses will take probably a little longer than others. Um, I think Athens has a great possibility of growth. And I think the, the Terrell campus has growth poss possibilities as well as the uh, Terrell HSC. I think Palestine may take a little, little while longer um, than, than that. Right now, the resources aren't there for us to be able to do a lot. And it, this does take resources to be able to, you've got to do some investing uh, in order to make this work. Um, we keep it to minimum and we, we look for those greatest returns on that investment but it does require some investment. And right now I think Palestine would probably have the, the furthest to go on that. Very good, thank you. And, and certainly uh, we, we, uh, we welcome the, the new ideas and, and, and thoughts and, and leadership that you bring into, into the group. Uh, then to Dr. King, Dr. King is a, a quarterly uh, update, uh, reasonable on how we're going, how it's doing. I think probably once we get going, a quarterly would be good, but I think it's going to take us a while to get going. Um, we're looking at probably the fall semester before we get started, uh, you know, uh, 100%. So once we get started, I'd be happy to put it on the agenda for us to talk about it on a quarterly basis. Wonderful. So when, when would that be then? 
Well, it's going to be, we're still doing a lot of research and sort of doing a lot of, of, um, of getting it together and getting it organized. So we, we're probably looking at the first quarter after the fall semester starts. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody have any other questions? I would just like to say, Steve, I just like to say um, thanks for the report, Dr. Parnell. And uh, I'm really interested to, to look at tying in your results to ultimately the entrepreneurial side of making a, or showing that profit or showing the financial impact of the study. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the key goals. Again, this started out because the budgets were so uncertain back, you know, several decades back. And so they were looking at this not only as a way to to, to get rid of the dips and dips and hills um, for enrollment, but also for funding. And so, um, you know, as I mentioned, at the University of North Dakota, we went from an average of 12,000 students a year to 15,000 students a year during the period we were working on this. So that significantly improved the, um, the financial sit setting of the campus. And I think it will here too. Dr. Phil, this is Ray. I just want to tell you, I, I enjoyed that presentation. Thank you, sir. And I sure like your enthusiasm. And I really think <laughs> you have been good for us. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You know, I always figured you, you can either go through life bored and, and unhappy, or you can go through life excited and happy. And I, I'm going to pick excited and happy every day of the week. Okay. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions? I think now that you can see uh, why we were so excited to get uh, Dr. Parnell here when we interviewed him back in, uh, I guess, in November, uh, he was, he, basically told us all those things that he just told us back in November, things that he wanted to do. And uh, so we're excited about having him here. We feel like he's gonna make a big difference for us uh, with enrollment and retention and his ideas and his enthusiasm is contagious. And we appreciate that very much. We're glad Thank to have you, you here. Thank you, sir. Let, let me, if it's okay, I'll go on to the next item I have and that's the TDCJ in service professional development. I just want to very briefly tell you a little bit about where we are with that. I've been giving you some information over the last few months in the up, weekly updates that I provide about some of the things that we've been doing with in-service uh, TDCJ, but I'd like to kind of tell you a little bit more about it tonight. I'm pr pretty excited. We had a meeting last Friday in Huntsville. Uh, the TBCC team, uh, which I like to call the A team, uh, went down to Huntsville and talked to the uh, to the staff there at uh, in Huntsville TDCJ staff. And uh, we really got some exciting news, some exciting opportunities, I think. And I just, we're just in the beginning stages and I just want to let you know kind of where we're going. Uh, to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a back, background, back in, in March when COVID came around, uh, TDCJ, as you know, we do the in-service uh, program for TDCJ for the 4,000 uh, employees that are in the northern unit, the four units, the four northern part of the state. And uh, back when mid-March uh, came around, uh, COVID hit and they stopped doing it and because of COVID. And basically they have not had in-service uh, activities since then. And so about the middle of the summer, we decided that COVID was gonna be around for a while and we needed to do something with them. So we called uh, the, the um, uh, deputy director, David Yebra, and talked to him and said, what can we do to, to help you with in-service? And basically he, he came down to Athens campus, brought some of his staff with him. We met with him, I think this was probably in July, the end of July. And uh, he basically, we came to the conclusion that we may wanna consider going to an online remote format for, for instead of having a face-to-face -face type environment that we do it remotely because at that time we didn't know when we were gonna be coming back uh, to uh, anyways because of COVID. So uh, we've been meeting on a, on a weekly basis. He's been up here uh, uh, since then uh, on our campus. We've been down there a couple of times on, at, in Huntsville. And uh, um, I, I, think, I think Dr. Collier, Holly Collier, who is our distance learning guru, kind of took charge of this uh, and took it over and, and really has worked really hard along with a lot of other people, uh, Kelly Townsend, Kristen Spazera, Sam Hurley, Jeff Watson, Philip Parnell, and others um, have really worked really hard uh, over the last seven or eight months 
and we developed or they developed a program where they could do their all of their uh, in-service online, do it remotely, do it through our Canvas system that we have here at TVCC. Again, this was not an easy project. This took a lot of time and a lot of effort on their part. So back when we met with them last, uh, last Friday, basically we are scheduled to start an online format for their in-service training for their 4,000 employees that they have. Um, uh, we're scheduled to start that April the 5th which is next week. So we feel very good about that. Uh, we also um, have talked to them off and on the last few um, months about the possibility of doing this on a statewide basis. And this is what we're most excited about. There's a possibility, a, a very, very strong possibility, especially after we met with them last Friday, that we may have an opportunity to do this online training for the entire state of Texas for all the uh, TDCJ employees that are required to do 40 uh, clock hours a year every year for in-service training. And uh, so there's a possibility, a very strong possibility, that we're going to be able to, at some point in the future, be able to do that training for, for 25,000 employees, 25,000 plus employees that are in the state of Texas. And again, it would be online, it would be uh, done remotely, it would be done through Canvas, Dr. Collier has got everything all lined up in terms of the of taking the, the instructional instruction and putting it online. And we're doing a training for the TDCJ instructors. And so we feel like we're ready to go. Let me tell you what the financial impact is for TBCC if this happens. Right now, with the 4,000 employees that we've been doing, and as you know, we've been doing those for the last eight years. That's the reason that we uh, did the uh, the uh, work, that, construction work that we did at, TD, at the uh, Palestine Workforce Center several, seven or eight years ago. Uh, we generate, uh, with those 4,000 uh, employees, we've been generating 48 contact hours a year. That's a 40 hour course. And at somewhere around $2.75 an hour, we're been, we've been generating around $500,000 a year uh, with, this, with these 4,000 employees. We've been doing that every year uh, in, the, in the last biennium. Um, this time, uh, obviously, because they have not been, um, been meeting uh, with, because of COVID, they are going to, we're not going to be able to have those uh, contact hours generated. And that was a re primary reason we wanted to meet with them about doing it online. Um, if we get to do uh, 25,000, which we believe we will, um, the next biennium, the next contact hour funding uh, cycle starts February, uh, J uh, March 1st, uh, 2022. If we can get this set up and lined up before then, and we believe we can, then we will generate uh, for 25,000 employees, we would generate uh, 48 contact hours a, um, a year for each one of those, and somewhere around $2.75 per contact hour funding, we would be generating around $3.25 million uh, if this happens. And that's what, again, exciting for us to be able to do this, but it's exciting for us financially as well. Uh, that would generate an additional $2.75 million uh, in addition to the half million dollars that we're generating now. Again, that would be, we would start counting that March 1st of 2022. We would count that through that next uh, year, uh, contact our funding, and it would go through February the 28th of 2023. In the next legislative, se legislative session, which was two years from now, they will uh, determine what the funding will be for the next biennium. Those contact hours will be included in that contact hour funding, if, the, if all this works out the way that we want it to. And uh, it would be then benefic benefiting the college from a revenue standpoint in the 2023-2024 school year and the 2024-2025 school year, and from that point on, as long as we continue doing the in-service training for the state of Texas, TDCJ. One of the, we have developed a strong partnership with TDCJ. Uh, they are depending upon us. We're the only community college in the state of Texas that's been working with them on this project. Uh, again, after we met with them last Friday, Basically, he gave us a thumbs up and said he's ready for us to move forward. 
And unless we run into some hiccups along the way, which obviously we're gonna probably run into some hiccups, but nothing that we can't overcome, uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. So that I, I kind of did this in a hurry for you. I'd be happy to send you some information about it a little bit later on to kind of put it in writing. But uh, this is what I wanted to tell you about in the President's Update. Now, does anybody have any questions for me about that? Uh, Dr. King, when yeah. will that decision uh, actually become final and is it contractual? It will be contractual. We talked about that last Friday. We will do an MOU with them, which will become contractual. And we're gonna be working on that in the next few weeks. So when is the decision actually due to be made? I mean, when do you know that you, you have it? You have the 4,000, you have 25,000 or, or, or what? The decision was made last Friday. It told us that we, we would be moving forward with it, but nothing was done in writing. It will be done in writing in an MOU as soon as we can put it together. Uh, okay, uh, a week, a month, or uh, I'm just trying to get a feel for when, when do you actually know you, you, you're going to do this? Yeah. Well, we're going to do it. I don't think there's any question about that I, based on what they told us last Friday. Again, they're, they're under the gun to get this done just to, because, again, they haven't done anything uh, throughout the state of Texas. So they're under the gun to get this done. So I don't think there's any question about doing it. It's a question about making it a formal process and getting it uh, in an MOU uh, format. You know, when you're working with TDCJ, oftentimes it takes a little bit longer to get things done in that, in that way. We've had to deal with them in the past in that way. So I can't give you a time frame, but I can tell you that we're gonna get it in front of them as quickly as we can. Uh, so could you update us next month on, on where that process stands? That, I can update great. you. It's a wonderful thing, and I know it represents the, the, the we hope, the end product of a lot of hard work. Uh, I do have this question. What, what about our uh, center in Palestine that we uh, substantially dedicated in service? Has, has it been producing, or is it idle, or uh, what's, what's the impact there uh, financially? We are doing, we are doing pre-service program there. We continue doing pre-service. It's been going on all along, but we have not been doing in-service because of COVID uh, there since mid-March. Okay, compared to pre-COVID, what's the revenue impact? Yeah. The revenue impact will be probably close to $500,000 in contact our funding if, they, if the legislature does not do a hold harmless but keep in mind, this is also something that we are going to be reimbursed for through the uh, relief funds. That, that was a question uh, too, as well. Okay, yeah. uh, that's, that's good. Yeah, it is good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody have any other questions about, it? I'll try to keep you updated as we go along on a weekly basis through my updates and, and other, other, other ways, but we're excited about this. This has been a lot of hard work. This has been a lot of time and effort and in addition to this, it, there will be additional cost. I want to also, you know, throw that into the to the picture here. Uh, there will be some additional cost. Uh, we we are working on on trying to determine uh, uh, what additional personnel may be required. Uh, uh, there's a potential that there will be additional administrative assistance or additional administrator that will be required. One or two of those. There may be some uh, IT requirements that we are, are going to be looking at. But again, we don't anticipate that being anything close to a, a major portion, but we'll bring that also out to you and let you know about that as time comes along. Anybody have any other questions about, any questions about that? Again, I can't, I can't tell you enough, uh, the work that's been done on that, it's been a weekly event. It's been work that's been above and beyond what our normal work, their normal workload is. And I can't tell you how uh, appreciative I am and how, how really um, TDCJ, you, you just, you really have to talk to them to understand how much they appreciate what we've done uh, and how, how they are, are thankful that they have a partnership with us to be able to do this for them because they never would have been able to do this on their own. And so I think they're, they've really uh, invested a lot of time in us and a lot of effort in us. And I think it's gonna be it's gonna pay off moving forward. 
Okay, uh, let me let me move on then. I've got a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that you've read about that in the newspaper. Uh, about three weeks ago, I think the American Rescue Plan Act, March the 11th, it was approved. Uh, basically, it's going to provide funds to TVCC and all the other institutions of higher, higher education institutions uh, around the around this, the country, uh, it will basically be able to be used for the same thing that the uh, HERF one CARES Act will be used for, and HERF two, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, CRRSAA Act that was passed back in December the 27th. We are still working to try to determine the guidelines for that. We're still working and trying to find out what we can and cannot do. Obviously, we're not going to do anything that we can't do, but we have been told that we're going to get even more funds for the American Rescue Plan Act than, than what we got from the HERF 2 Act. We got uh, $4.5 million for the HERF 2 Act. So that means that we have been told that we're going to get more than that. We don't know the exact number yet, but we've been told it's going to be more than that. So we're looking forward to finding more information out about that, getting more information about that. And as I get more information, I'll give that information to you as well. We've got Dr. Parnell and David Hopkins really working on that on behalf of the college to make sure that we're doing what's, what's supposed to be doing with it. David, do you have anything you want to add about that? Uh, no, I, I will uh, tell the board and we can talk more in just a minute that we finally do have some pretty good guidance on the HERF-2 and the HERF-1 funds. Uh, they're euphemistically calling the American Rescue HERF-3, for lack of a better term, I guess. But we do have some pretty good guidance, and we are going to be proceeding with uh, that. We're also working on the student side. Uh, that's, you know, was always clear cut on there, but uh, we have money for the students as well. Again, we'll, we'll give you information more on HERF 3 uh, as soon as we get that information and we know more, know more about it. Any questions about that? Uh, Dr. King, last meeting, we, we uh, anticipated or based on, I think, uh, a, a fairly, we thought a fairly good understanding of, of, of how those funds could be applied. And we also talked about that dollar amount, a portion of which, of course, was was pretty clear as David said already, you know, direct to student and that that part's not hard. But the other part, we had some discussion and, and I thought had your agreement that uh, you would would come back to us with a, an outline of how you anticipated those funds uh, to, to be applied, kind of how they lined up with what's going away versus what that's going to replace, you know, that sort of thing. I'm just mainly wanting to be sure that we see and understand uh, what what we're what we're losing, and and how that's being offset uh, with these because we're talking about a lot of money here. Uh, is is that uh, still too early, or is that something that that uh, our capable Mr. Hopkins is going to talk about? Well, our capable Mr. Hopkins is going to talk a little bit about it, but you're right; it's a little early because we're still getting some guidance and some some direction. We did get some last week, actually. I guess it was last week, wasn't it, David, that we got the information. So we're still learning as we go along. And as soon as we get it all put together, then I think our very capable uh, David Hopkins is going to give you that information. <coughs> David, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, uh, David, I'll tell you that uh, we have some pretty good guidance now, and I can talk a little bit about that during the financial report if you want. Uh, yes, I would like that very much. Okay. Anybody have any other questions about HERF 1, HERF 2, or HERF 3? Okay, the next item I was going to talk about was the uh, regional uh, volleyball tournament that we're hosting here the latter part of this week on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We're excited about that. Uh, we've got summer uh, 2021 and fall 2021 semesters that are pretty close to being finalized. I was going to let Kristen Spazera mention that and talk about that for a minute. 
Thank you. Um, the summer schedule is finalized and it's out on the web for everyone to view. We, we scheduled out summer similar to what we've done in previous semesters. It's a heavier online schedule than we have in the fall and spring semesters. And that's primarily because of the fact that our summer semesters, because of the times of when they start and end, overlap with when ISDs are finishing out for the school year and when university students are available. <clears throat> um, so that is very normal to what we have in the past. Our fall schedule is about 98% complete. We have it already out on the schedule for viewing, um, but we're just we're finishing up some, you know, just some small issues that have come up. But we are scheduling out as normal and normal meeting pre COVID. What we have found um, with talking with the colleges across the state of Texas is um, all the colleges, there has not been a single college that has come back to say that they're scheduling out with COVID uh, restrictions. We are going back to full face-to-face -face classes without any restrictions. So we are looking at really kind of more of what we had in fall of 2019, which is around roughly 55% face-to-face with 45% online offerings. One of the things that we have learned from talking with our advisors and from talking with our students is that they want to be back either in face-to-face -face classes or in fully online. They're, they really are over the Zoom capabilities and those Zoom offerings. So we are, um, we are listening to them and we're scheduling out the face-to-face and we, we learned great lessons last year. And if we have to make um, changes due to COVID restrictions, we know how to do that effectively and um, it, that for the best interest of our students. Thank you, Kristen. Anybody have any questions about the summer schedule or the fall schedule? Very good, thank you. The next item I had, I wanted to introduce uh, Emily Hangland. Emily is um, is our new executive director of our of our foundation, uh, TBCC Foundation. I think she's somewhere. I see you there, Emily. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Emily. We're very fortunate and we're very glad to have her as our new executive director. Emily, for the last five years, has been the executive director of, of Trinity Valley Casa. She's worked with a large number of volunteers over the last uh, few years. She's worked with fundraising. She's worked with um, different types of promotional activities, different types of, 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 of uh, working with donors and other things of that nature. We're getting somebody that already knows Henderson County, Anderson County, and uh, well, she's worked extensively over in, J in Jacksonville in Cherokee County, but we feel very fortunate to have her and we feel very glad to have her. Her first day will be April the 1st, which will be this Thursday. So I just, Emily, do you have anything you'd like to say? I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> That's okay. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to get started. And I've already been over uh, on Friday, this past Friday, I came over and chatted a little bit with Linda Land and Candy uh, in, in, I guess, what will be my office. And uh, we had a good visit and I met uh, Marlo as well. And so we had a, just a really good time and I've um, got a few ideas and I'm looking forward to jumping in. Sounds great, Emily. Um, Thank you very much. And again, we we, uh, we we really got a good one when we got Emily. I think it's going to make a significant difference for our college. Thank you. Uh, I, I think that uh, I wanted to mention the next board meetings on April the 26th, but I also I didn't list it on the agenda, but I wanted Kelly Townsend to give you an update on two grants that she has received in the last, I guess, four months. Kelly, would you mind telling us about that? I put them in my updates, but I want you to talk about them. Sure. Um, so uh, the state of Texas, so that would have been um, the co-board put out um, a grant announcement back in um, September for us to be uh, for community colleges to be able to apply for a reskilling grant. Um, and basically what that grant is for is for any um, individual in the state of Texas who has been affected by COVID in a negative way, which most people have been, um, but that would mean um, in, in a translation would be those who had to quit school or those who lost their job uh, would have the ability to come back um, to a community college and complete their education, which whether it be a certificate or a degree within one year. 
Um, the caveat to that is that they couldn't have been enrolled in any higher education um, in the previous um, uh, six months or long semester. Um, so we applied. Um, it's very specific on, um, you know, the, the qualifications, um, very specific on what programs you could use. So we wrote the grant. Um, we were awarded in um, October uh, for $300,000. Um, a second round of that same grant came out in January, um, kind of like with, you know, the, the CARES grants, they keep putting this, this money out there. Um, so we reapplied. Um, added some different programs to it, some more programs so that we could cover all of our workforce programs, um, because that is what it's basically for is just workforce programs. And we were awarded another $300,000. So we have been awarded $600,000 in the past six months um, for reskilling of um, Texas workers and Texas um, students who um, have um, been negatively affected by COVID. Um, what we are doing now is we've put together a big marketing campaign. We have a um, list of 11,000 students from TVCC over the past 10 years who have not completed um, a degree or certificate. They'd started, but they never completed. So we're going to be doing direct contact with those students um, to try to get them to come back and complete. Um, the grant is only for tuition and fees. It is not for books, um, but that's you know, that that's great. If they can finish it within a year, that's, you know, going to be a phenomenal thing. So we're looking, um, doing some, you know, heavy duty uh, publicity, talking about some different marketing campaigns we want to do. Um, the grant, um, both of them um, end in February of 2023, I believe. Yes. Um, so we'll have that money, you know, for the next um, few semesters. And so working with financial aid to get um, an application process put together. Um, and we're really, we're very proud of it. Um, so far, um, with little or no um, true advertising, we have already had two applicants that have applied. Well, actually, we've had four. Nobody has met the requirements yet, unfortunately. Um, kind of like Dr. Parnell said um, at a meeting earlier this week, you know, um, the government will give you all this money, you know, they want to give you all these opportunities for all this money, but they make it so incredibly difficult to utilize it. Um, and that's the only bad part about these two grants is that it is the requirements are so stringent that on the student that it is, it's going to be hard to perhaps find those students, but we are, um, are doing our due diligence, so to speak. Thank you, Kelly. Anybody have any can, questions? Yeah, any questions for Kelly? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Okay, we're going to use that, as Kelly mentioned, to really market the college and market students and, and let them know they can come up here if, if they qualify for, for tuition and free, tuition and fees paid for. So that's all I have, uh, right? Then our next meeting is April the 26th. Okay, thank you. For, <clears throat> that's Welcome. been a good report. Uh, all right, we'll move to item number four. Consider the minutes of the February 22nd, uh, 2021 meeting. Minutes. <clears throat> Do I hear a motion? We approve those minutes as presented. I so move. <clears throat> all right, Jerry makes motion to be approved. I hear a second. Second. All a second's motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Uh, All polls like sign. Motion carries. Item number six, consider the business financial and investment report for January of 2021. And we're going to let the very capable David Hopkins do that for us. <laughs> okay. Uh, just uh, I want to talk about the revenue first. And while we're talking about that, we'll talk about the uh, HERF 1 and 2. <clears throat> Uh, as you can see, as Norma has brought this up, I might have to look at my computer because my revenue is covered up. The main ones I want to point out, you, tuition and fees is down 1.5 million as of January. Uh, that number changes uh, to 1.4 in February and 1.398 in March. You know, January is sort of the beginning of the spring. Uh, so we're, you know, we're looking at roughly $700,000 a semester. 
And you see the other numbers there for housing, food service, and bookstore. These are the main things now that uh, the DOE has given us some pretty good guidance that we can follow related to lost revenue. Um, and briefly, what they've said basically is like most emergencies, uh, they finally realized that they're letting us go back to the beginning of the emergency, which is March 13th of 2020, I believe. So <clears throat> expenses that they're allowing as well as lost revenue for any of the funds that we've received are now eligible for lost revenue and expenses back to that date. Most expenses we've already taken and captured those in the project, uh, including the refunds for housing and board last uh, summer. What we didn't capture is the lost revenue for last summer, about 800,000. We've got some possible TDCJ salaries that we're waiting on an answer for. And the bottom line is what, uh, to answer David's question is, the approach that we're gonna take, they've given us a couple of options is, we're gonna take the summer, basically the summer semester uh, and draw that money down and then look at it and probably do a drawdown based on semesters. They've allowed us to do it that way or by fiscal year. Um, I just like would, to know where I stand a little sooner than just 12 every 12 months because we're still gonna be incurring expenses. Uh, but the good news is that um, we had about 378,000 left of HERF 1 money, about 3.8 million of HERF 2, and this is institutional side only, by the way, $4.2 million going forward, uh, which my team and I will be uh, putting together, you know, do our due diligence, make the estimates, uh, and do our backup before we start drawing the money down. But I do believe based on what I'm seeing now that um, we'll be pretty much made whole for last summer, this fall, and certainly this spring. And then after that, you know, of course we don't know what the future holds at this point, but uh, I don't really see us losing uh, any revenue in those areas. And does anybody have any questions? I, I didn't go over all the gory details that the DOE gave us, but uh, I think that was a question outstanding at the last meeting. I'm gonna talk about the expense side of it in a minute, but before I move on. Okay. On, uh, on page two, Norma, if you'll scroll down. What I wanted to kind of go over are some things that, uh, and David, I think we had, you mentioned this at the last meeting. You can see they're mainly in oper maintenance and operations. Uh, I want to kind of cover the, the items that we're kind of seeing uh, based on COVID, some of its timing. Obviously travels down $286,000. We think that may change over the summer. We may be able to do some. There may be registration fees and online classes, uh, but that's gonna be a savings to us uh, because obviously it's no mystery that travel has been shut down. Uh, supplies and materials, kind of the same thing. You know, We don't have as many people on campus, um, not as many face-to-face -face classes. We're just, we're not spending as much on supplies. And again, the bookstore purchases for resale um, that number is at 40% now. I think by March, it's down to 30, but be that as it may, obviously that's going to follow the revenue to a certain extent uh, as we had less purchases there. Um, major repairs is not really due to COVID in my opinion. Uh, last year, we about this time, we had some gas leaks. Everybody remembers the infamous gas leaks. Uh, we had some expenses around this time that we, we haven't had this year. So that's really kind of that difference. Scholarships uh, flips the other way. Uh, but actually that difference, again, I think I pointed this out two or three times. Uh, we've got a journal entry in February that's prior year. 
that thing falls to within twenty thousand. I'm excuse me, about thirty thousand dollars come February. So that that's just a timing issue there. Uh, utilities. Almost hesitate to talk about utilities. They're down again. Same reason. Fewer people on campus. Uh, but I, I guess everybody understands this is before Snowmageddon. So I think we'll have a, a month here where utilities will take a spike up. But again, I think that's less activities being held on campus for your students on campus uh, and your utilities are down. You know, overall that's uh, maintenance and operations about $550,000. Uh, and David, I think that's, I wanted to try to answer your question about, you know, we're, we're getting revenue back, but we also have expenses that are, that are saving us money kind of for the same reason. And I hope I answered that question. If, if, if there's anything else, let me know. David, I think you have. My, my main interest was being able to, to track, you know, what is our dependency on, on the, the federal government CARES money funding. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, so that we can keep in focus that, um, that we're servicing or providing services to about 13% fewer students than we were when we created and adopted this budget. Right. And that our operations reflect that as well. The reimbursement part of GET, I, I think it would be you know, really handy and I'm sure you have it somewhere or in some fashion that you know, says we, we, didn't, we didn't get this. Um, the, the government gave it to us and the government's not gonna keep giving. I mean, near term, it may be so, but there, there is an end point and where we're gonna be when that time comes. No, that, that's where my interest lies. And, and I, I know you get that. Uh, so any, anything that helps us to stay abreast of, of where we're really going as an institution uh, with enrollment numbers having gone backward and we understand why that's not mm -hmm. you know, throwing stones, but it is simply saying we better recognize it. And we also better recognize it when it comes to our, our management decisions that relate to expenses. And uh, I appreciate that you are. I'm just trying to see it and understand it. Right. Well, and I did want to tell you, uh, that's a good point. The, the time frame for the, the current money that we're talking about, HERF 1 and HERF 2, uh, goes obviously back to the date of the emergency, but it runs from uh, then to this January, a year from then, January of 2022. Then we have another extension of another year to January 2023. So uh, they have they have strung this out there for two years. So um, that's another reason that I wanted to do this semester by semester because you know we're covering lost revenue, but we're also covering expenditures related to COVID. And, um, you know, we'll continue to incur those as long as we're affected by it. That's why I want to keep up kind of a running total. And I'll, I'll probably mention this every month about where we stand on this particular issue, you know, expenses, what we've drawn down, kind of what money we haven't drawn down, that kind of thing. And try to keep you all up to date. That's great. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, if we could scroll down again, that's that's probably on on expenses. I wanted to talk about the uh, very quickly the investment in cash summary. Uh, you'll see on all three of these pages, January uh, is kind of the month because all the property taxes are due. That's we get a lot of cash coming in. Uh, next page is the monthly investment report. Um, and you see that number there, and I'll talk about on the next page, the 15,682,904 in cap reserve uh, on the next page, Norma. We have finally uh, caught up with transfers, expenses, and all that sort of thing. And I, David, I think this is what you've been waiting for. We finally got to the 15.6 million. Uh, we've cleared out all the uh, you know, expenses, transfers, retainage, all those things. The only thing we've got this month are the, the normal budgetary transfers. 
We've got $7,700 related to the HSC parking lot, which are architect fees. Uh, that's the only thing to my knowledge that we have going presently that is authorized out of capital reserve. And I think everybody should be proud that we're at the 15.6 million mark. Uh, we've made up a lot of ground pretty fast. So um, I'm, I'm pretty excited for the next two years. I, I know everybody probably feels about government handouts, but um, you know, if, if it winds up going in reserve, so be it. Anybody have any questions about that? Uh, David, just one, and it would lead to, I guess, question for uh, whoever this the board in general. But uh, earnings, uh, do, you, do you have a feel for what our, our nominal uh, rate may be? Or, or put another way, it's not very much, and we do have uh, some amount uh, of debt still out there. And I, I would just like to what? plug in for us to have a conversation uh, about that, about retiring that debt. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. We were we were talking that uh, about that very thing today about whether we wanted to bring it to the board in April. Uh, you know, CDs and stuff. I've I've got to spread some money out among CDs, but that's basically less than one percent. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, our rate on the bonds, I believe, is about one point seven or so, and. That, that's an option that we have. We'd have to put it on the agenda. Obviously, if the board wants to do that is to, since we are going to be made whole from a revenue standpoint, um, you know, we could have the option. We could go ahead and take it out of cap reserve now. And, you know, at the end of the year, that all that money is going to roll back in there per board uh, procedure. Um, but that is something we talked about today. And if, if certainly if if the board wants to do that, we would have to put it on the April agenda. Um, if you wanted to talk about maybe making a decision, could we could we do that, Dr. King, at our next meeting? Yes, we can. I think David didn't we say this afternoon that we owed two point four million. Right. We we've already made the payment for this year. We've got uh, essentially two payments left: two point four million plus you know accrued interest at whatever time we do that. So. Uh, you know, whatever that winds up being. Interest isn't much, obviously, but it's 1.2 million. It's going to be a little bit. Does anybody have anything else on that one? I think on the last slide there is the payments over 25,000. We had, uh, other than the normals, um, landscaping, irrigation, maintenance, and work, athletic uniforms and um, we didn't pay the Bruce Field uh, fee until January because we didn't use it in the fall. And uh, Randy Jones and I agreed that, you know, we'll pay it when the season started, which is gonna be in spring. And that's really all I had, unless anybody had anything else about uh, the CARES. Um, I did wanna say a thank you to, Kim Croha, she's the one that helps me put this together. And Ms. Croha is going to be leaving us. This will be the last time the board uh, gets to talk to her. I'm not very excited about her leaving, but uh, everybody has other opportunities. But I wanted to take a minute to thank her since she's a big part of this report. Thank you, David, for a good yeah. report. <clears throat> All right, down here, a motion that we, can, that we approve the Business Financial Investment Report for January 2021. I'll make a motion. Dr. Charlie makes a motion. I hear second. Second. David seconds a motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, all opposed like sign. Motion carries. Item number six, consider and discuss copier, printer, purchase Boy, this, this came up at our last meeting we we had have always as far as i know at least uh the this um this printer uh or one like it in the past and i think it was mike kimberly that brought up why don't we look into the possibility of purchasing it 
And we did, and you can purchase it for $26,234.25, um, which if you look over a five-year period of time, if you lease it, it would be $35,516.50. So by purchasing it, we can save $9,282.25. Uh, we have we can use uh, we didn't budget twenty six thousand dollars for it because it was going to be uh, uh, done in a lease format, but we do have at least half of that in the current print shop budget, and the other half of that thirteen thousand dollars can come out of uh, unencumbered uh, salary accounts that we are have not used and will not use this year. So we can cover that if the board chooses to do that. Any questions about that? Follow your recommendation. Okay. All right. David, do you want to make that motion? I uh, so move. All right. I hear a second to that motion. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, Steve seconds the motion to purchase the uh, copy of printer. All in favor say aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. All opposed like sign. Motion carries. Item number seven, consider and discuss personnel updates. Uh, board, we have personnel updates, I think in front of you there, or you had the opportunity to look at those. We had the normal resignations. It, we uh, hate to see Kim leave, but she's getting a better opportunity uh, in, in uh, closer to where she lives. We have retirements. We have new hires. We have Emily on that group. And then we have a, a, a reclassification from someone going from Palestine coming over to Athens. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. I hate to see Jim Guillory leave. Jim Guillory has been here for over 40 years. He's our, been our physics and physical science teacher. And you hate to see somebody like that leave, but I think he said he's ready to hang them up. And Vivian uh, Hardgrave has been with us for the last four or five years and She's going in the TRS system as well. All right, any other questions? If not, I uh, hear a motion. We approve the personnel updates. I got a motion. Paula makes a motion. Did I hear a second? Second. <laughs> who, who was that? Dr. Dr. Rockinger. Okay. All in, uh, any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Okay. Right. Okay, we need a, a, a motion from somebody to go into executive session, and then I'll tell y'all what I'm fixing to do. <laughs> all right, I hear a motion go into executive session. I'll make, a motion. I'll make that motion. We're going to get it. Dr. Charlie yeah. made the motion. Ron Day seconded. Ron Day, Ron Day second the motion. All right. Uh, okay. Ron, what I'm what gonna, you have? Okay. What, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a, a breakout room for the board members to go in. So all other attendees for the board meeting, you may leave the meeting or you may stay in. It's whatever you want to do if you want to uh, see the see the end of the meeting, you can stay and we'll come back to you. And otherwise you can leave the meeting because this is the last thing on the meeting. So uh, you can go ahead and begin that process. And I'm gonna do a breakout room and I'm gonna assign all the board members into this breakout room. And we'll let you know when y'all can start with no one else there. So that's what I'm fixing to do. Whenever I start assigning you to, if you're on Zoom, uh, a little icon will pop up and it'll say join the breakout session and all you have to do is click it and you'll be in it. And then Ron Day is on the phone and we will get him automatically into the meeting. So that's what I'm fixing to do. Hey, I uh, entertain a motion to to uh, uh, state hey. that uh, the, the closed session is closed and no action was taken. Okay. Here. We, we need to go to item number nine on the agenda, right? Item number nine on the agenda. Item number nine. Okay, uh, consider appointment. Okay, 
uh, we have no, I... we have we have uh, closed the executive session for the uh, consideration appointment of district uh, of district nine board member vacancy. No action was taken. We we need a, we we need a motion on item number nine to take no action to table it. Okay, it, that's what I'm doing. Okay, he, uh, who wants to make a motion? We approve. I'll it. make it. I'll make the motion. Okay, Doc Charlie makes a motion. I hear a second. Okay. I second it. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, lock sign. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, with no <clears throat> no other business to hand, uh, Dr. Charlie, do you want to send us home? Uh, well, I make a motion we adjourn. All right. Dr. Charlie, make a motion we adjourn. I hear a second. Second. Okay. Paul, a second some motion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Motion carried. Good night, you all. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Thank you. Good Bye. Night. Thank you, guys.